I'm William Zinzer, and I'm going to start by reading you something by the British writer George Orwell. Because before we go any farther, I want you to meet the enemy. I'm going to read you Orwell's translation into modern bureaucratic sludge of a famous verse from the book of Ecclesiastes in the King James Bible. The original passage, which you know, goes like this. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. That's a wonderful sentence. It's clear, and it's human, and it's alive. Now, here's how Orwell says the verse would come out today in the pompous, bloated language of our own times. You'll recognize the style. It's in your mail every morning. Here it is. Objective consideration of contemporary phenomena compels the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably be taken into account. That's also a wonderful sentence. If you don't remember anything else I say, remember that sentence, because that sentence is the enemy. Let me go back to both versions and show you why. The first passage from Ecclesiastes, just at a glance, makes you want to read it. And the second one, just at a glance, makes you not want to read it. Always remember, writing is visual. It catches the eye before it has a chance to catch the brain. In the first version, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift. The words are short. They have air around them. They convey the rhythms of human speech. The second one is so clotted with long, dead words. The objective consideration of contemporary phenomena compels the conclusion that there's only room for about three of the words on a line, and instinctively we just don't want to go anywhere with a mind that expresses itself in such ponderous language. We don't even start to read, and I don't think we should. But even more important than how the words look is what they say, what kind of words they are. In the first passage, all the words are plain words that we can relate to our own lives. Bread, battle, sun, race, riches, strong, swift, time, chance, etc. Remember, writing is clear and strong and warm in proportion to the extent that you can enable the reader to visualize something that he or she does in his or her own life so that you make human contact with your reader at every step of your journey. In this case, the reader is saying, yes, bread, battle, riches, I know what those are. The reader is identifying with a writer who is reminding us that life is capricious, that time and chance happen to us all. The second passage consists of long, flabby nouns that embody a vague concept, consideration, conclusion, capacity, but that don't have any people in them doing something that you can picture. Nouns that denote a vague concept are the death of vigorous writing. Good writing is specific and concrete. In that second passage, there's nothing that we can grab onto, nothing concrete, and relate to our own lives. Now, why is that? What's the principle here? The principle involves two elements, verbs and nouns or I should say, good verbs and bad verbs, and good nouns and bad nouns. Let me tell you about verbs, wonderful verbs, especially wonderful active verbs. Active verbs are the strongest tools you're given as a writer. So fall in love with active verbs. Get them to work for you as often as you can. The difference between active verbs and passive verbs in your writing is the difference between life and death. Or, as Mark Twain said about the difference between the right word and the wrong word, it's the difference between the lightning and the lightning bug. Ideally, if you could write an article, or anything else, using only active verbs, no passive verbs, your article would almost automatically have clarity and warmth and vigor. Why is that? It's because active verbs give momentum to a sentence and push it forward. They embody a physical act that the reader can picture, like push, 
when I just said push it forward, you could visualize a verb literally shoving the sentence forward. If I had put it in the passive and said, momentum is given to a sentence by active verbs and the sentence is pushed forward by it, there is no momentum, no push, and certainly no vigor. What active verbs also do is to enable the reader to picture who did what. That's because they require someone to activate the verb. That someone can be a pronoun, I, he, we, or it can be a noun, like boy or girl, or it can be a person, John Smith or Nancy Jones, but someone has to activate that active verb. So with an active verb, the reader can always picture somebody doing something that he or she, the reader, might do. Passive verbs have no such action that you can picture. They tug fitfully at a sentence. Procedures were implemented. And you have no idea what was being implemented, by whom, to whom, on whom. I use implemented because it's the kind of word that writers who use passive verbs tend to use, or I should say to perpetrate. So these passive sentences are not only dead, they're also ambiguous. They could be read in several different ways. Whereas if you use an active verb, there's never any doubt. John went to the office and saw Tom, one specific action. Tom was seen at the office by John. When? How often? Every day? Once a week? It's fuzzy. Earlier I mentioned that Thoreau is one of the American writers I most admire for the plain strength of his writing. Mainly his writing has strength because he uses active verbs to push his meaning along. Let's take a famous sentence from his great book, Walden, and then turn it into the passive. Here's Thoreau's sentence. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn from it what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Look at all those wonderful short active verbs. Went, wished, front, see, learn, die, discover. We know exactly what Thoreau is saying. We also know a lot about him, about his curiosity and his vitality. How alive Thoreau is in that sentence. It's an autobiography in 44 words. 39 of which, incidentally, are words of one syllable. Think about that. Only five words in that long, elegant sentence have more than one syllable. Brevity. Short is better than long. Now let me turn that sentence into the passive. Here it is. A decision was made to go into the woods because of a desire for a deliberate existence and for exposure to only the essential facts of life and for possible instruction in its educational elements, and because of a concern that at the time of my death the absence of a meaningful prior experience would be apprehended. All a life has been taken out of that sentence. But what's the one big thing I've taken out of that sentence? I've taken Thoreau out of that sentence. He's nowhere to be seen. And I've done it just by turning all the active verbs into passive verbs. Yet that sentence, that sterilized Thoreau, is no exaggeration. Most people and most businesses in America today write in that flabby, dead, pompous, passive voice style. What I also want you to hear is that every time I replaced one of Thoreau's active verbs with a passive verb, I also had to add a passive noun to make the passive verb work. I went to the woods because has become a decision was made. I had to add the noun decision. To see if I could learn what it had to teach, two terrific verbs, learn and teach, we've all learned and we've all been taught, has become for possible instruction. Can you hear how dead those nouns are? Decision, instruction, they have no people in them doing anything. So what I want to get into your ear and into your metabolism so that it becomes automatic is that active verbs are your strongest tools. And any time you can turn a passive voice sentence into an active voice sentence, you will make that sentence come alive.